Bon, bah, bonjour à tous. Aujourd'hui, on a le plaisir d'accueillir Tullio Traverso, qui a fait sa thèse au LADIX et qui est maintenant en postdoc euh, à l'Institut Alan Turing à Londres, en Angleterre. Euh, du coup, je te laisse la parole, Tullio. Merci. 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 Bon, je vais présenter en anglais, comme j'ai dit avant. Euh, donc, je vais commencer right away. Um, this is the work I, I will present the work that I done, I've done during my PhD and a little bit of what I'm doing now and try to see the, um, what connects them and what is the sort of the line of thought. So um, in general, what I've worked on so far, it's the uh, numerical and mathematical modeling of active suspensions, so microparticles that swims, especially the one that are uh, synthetic. This is what you see, fluid dynamics. Uh, in g in today, I will focus mainly on um, these two uh, these two parts. So the first one, as I said, is basically a a the study of, of a system starting from first principles and using a continuum probabilistic description. And we're gonna characterize a system where uh, stochastic and deterministic effects sort of compete between each other and and generate the collective dynamics that we see. On the other hand, um, I will, of course, they, they represent the physics hopefully uh, accurately uh, by using stochastic processes and uh, to quantify the uncertainty of the, of the outcome. So let's start with the, the part about suspensions. Um, I'll introduce a little bit of what and why we do this. Then we're going to look at the particles, at the, say, at the individual level, so very close to the particle at the microscopic scale. And then we're going to see their collective dynamics, uh, so at larger uh, both length and time scales. And, uh, and then we're going to see how these suspension respond to uh, external stimulation and, and confinement. So uh, this is, uh, I think, a good way to introduce uh, what we mean by collective behavior. So uh, what this flock of birds is doing is uh, happening because each individual flock, each individual bird, interacts with the other, in this case, simply visually, by uh, looking at the, probably, uh, by looking at the one that are close, flying close to him. Uh, and, um, and the important thing is that uh, the, there are two length scales, uh, and the collective behaviors happens on a length scale that is much larger than both the length scale of the single particle, but also the length scales of their interactions. Like they might interact in within a couple of meters, and the, the characteristic length scale that describes this flock is uh, much larger than that. Then if we also consider uh, external factors uh, that are not due to interaction, there's also another length scale that is one of the migration of the flock through maybe continents, but that's due to an external effect. Um, this happens at microscopic scale too, so particle interacts in different way. Certain strain of E. coli, for example, form aggregates. Uh, and these aggregates are formed because they are attracted to each other through chemical gradients and chemical signals that they produce. So a particle attracts the other and there is an instability, let's say, of a, the, the suspension doesn't remain uniform, uh, but they aggregate in, uh, in little spots like, like there. Um, and the same microorganism, but if we take a different strain uh, with no chemical uh, interactions between particles um, and we put a sufficiently dense suspension in uh, water, we see this kind of behavior. So this is known sometimes as uh, a microscopic turbulence and uh, bacterial turbulence. And in this case, uh, the, what we see can be explained by, at least qualitatively, by hydrodynamic interactions between particles. So again, we see correlated motion of the particle. Here is another and last example with the microscopic synthetic swimmer. So these one are bottom heavy and they stay at the, basically they swim on a substrate in water. And they swim because they basically uh, self-generate a electrochemical imbalance across their, their body. And the important thing that I wanted to point out is they also, uh, they also display some form of collective behavior. These are called dynamic clusters. They are dynamic because, well, first because they move, and also because the particles that are part of the cluster change continuously. They are, they are exchanged by the gas phase in between, which is stable, uh, in the sense that they're not eventually collapse in one cluster. They're just, it's a, there's a stable gas phase, and there are clusters that exchange particles with it. So let's see a little bit closer how these particles move, um, at least a very simplistic model of how they move. 
So uh, the idea is that they perform, um, the, the mechanism by which they move is called phoresis. And uh, so imagine you have the simplest possible scenario where you have a particle in a solution. This solution has one species, a solid, and then there is the solvent. The solid molecules are the blue ones, and uh, if there is a gradient of concentration of solid across the particle, uh, due to the fact that uh, there is an interaction potential between these solid molecules and the big particle, and also the solid molecules at the big and, and the big particles, but this interaction potential is different, this drives a tangential stress. Long story short, this stress from far away, sufficiently far away, can be approximated by a slip velocity because the boundary layer that forms is very tiny. This property is called mobility. So we say that the particle, in this simplistic model, drives a slip velocity that is proportional through a coefficient m to the local chemical gradient. How do, you say, how do they self-propel? Some particles, like the one I showed you before, uh, they catalyze a chemical reaction on one hemisphere. So in practice, in practice, they don't need to be into an external gradient to move, but they can self-generate this gradient. And um, thus, if we, if we say the color outside is a concentration field and this active side emits some chemical with a constant uh, emission rate, A, uh, then we, we see this is the result, and clearly there is a gradient, and the slip velocity develops and the particle moves. So because, because of these two simple um, boundary conditions on the particles, we have a coupling of the chemical and the hydrodynamic problem. So the problem uh, of the flow disturbance that the particles introduce depends on, uh, on both. Um, now, talking about hydrodynamics, at this scale, uh, if we look at the Reynolds number and we assume that we are in water, whether we consider um, a synthetic swimmer or, um, or, nat or biological swimmers, we see that in general, the Reynolds number is very small. So, in practice, this means that we need only to solve the Stokes equation, not full Navier Stokes, which are linear. And uh, I would say, if so from now on, when I talk about superposing flow fields, that's uh, legitimate. Like we can do that because we are in the in a, the flow field is linear, and we can think of effects as a superposition of of things. And this is where uh, it might be helpful. So, let's look at what a swimmer does by itself. Uh, the, this property that I called mobility and activity, so the activity we fix it. We say, okay, there is an active cap on one side and we, that, that one, we keep it like that. Now the mobility, um, well, because we need a chemical imbalance. The mobility can be uh, of any kind, of course, doesn't necessarily mean, need to be uniform. So if it is uniform, uh, what happens is that the hydrodynamic signature in the Stokes uh, flow that this particle introduces by swimming is that of a force dipole, uh, sorry, of a source dipole, meaning that it displaces fluid in front and it let it go behind, and that decays as, as one over R cubed, and it's, it's very, it decays fast. However, if the particle has a non-uniform mobility, so let's say it takes a couple of prototypes, it is zero somewhere and non-zero somewhere else, what happens is that the high, let's say the hydrodynamic thrust and drag that are constantly balanced because the particles swim at constant velocity and they are force free. Um, the hydrodynamic thrust and the hydrodynamic um, uh, drag, they do not have the same point of application like in, in micro microorganisms. And therefore, this introduces a force dipole. If the thrust force is skewed towards the back, we have a pusher or a puller the other way around. So uh, it really... Um, it really changes the, the hydrodynamic signature, and the, this is the, from far away, this looks like a purely radial flow that decays as one over r squared. So it's one of the more, uh, it, it decays one of the faster, uh, sorry, slower. So it be, can be important in the far field. Now, just to give you uh, a taste of what actually the flow field then look like, we need to consider also the external gradient. So let's say now there is an external gradient. Once we are either in this case or in this case, which are hydrodynamically more relevant, the external gradient, uh, can, we can superimpose, again, the effect. And so we, it, it drives a slip velocity on the surface. It creates, because of the non-uniform mobility, it creates a torque imbalance and makes the particle align either towards or against the gradient. So in this case, what we have is that first the particle tends to align to chemical gradient. So at a form, it is a form of response to chemical signaling, a little bit like the microorganism. And also, it modifies the flow field. So again, just to wrap it up, 
what happens is that we have a self-induced, this is the stresslet tensor that characterizes the completely the, the, the Stokes flow solution in the far field. And this, this contribution here is typical of microorganism and depends only on the direction of the streamer. For this particle, we need to account also for another term, which depends on both the direction of the particle and the direction of the gradient. Uh, so now we, that we have in mind that actually these particles are never completely pusher or pullers, like they are somewhere in between. Uh, so we want to see this, uh, the collective dynamics of this particle. So how do they interact? Well, as I said, they introduce flow disturbances and they introduce chemical disturbances. So they might interact. Um, what is the role of subpropulsion and what is the role of these two interaction routes? And so we look at the collective motion. How do we model, first of all, this collective uh, motion? We could use a particle based approach that's very computationally expensive or we could use like we do a, a continuum approach that is approximated and works well with far field interactions only so in dilute suspension and we have a, um, a density psi which which is the one particle distribution function that tells you how probable it is how likely it is that a particle is at point x oriented along direction p at time t and follows this just a conservation equation where the v these two flux are determined by how the particle move. So just let go through the terms very quickly. Self-propulsion, okay, the particle moves along its direction P with a constant speed. It is advected by the fluid with velocity U, which is the local fluid velocity, is the Faxon's law in, in Stokes flow. And this, uh, this is also the drift due to the chemical gradient. And the coefficient in front, how does it move in the chemical gradient? Well, that depends on the mobility and of the particle. Basically, as we said, the mobility is, uh, is what determines. Then there is diffusion. This is a term due to diffusion because we're in the small scale and, 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 and noise counts. Rotation, same thing. We rotate with half of the vorticity because it's a sphere. We rotate in the gradient if we have non-uniform mobility, as I said before, and then we diffuse because we are bumped into uh, solvent molecules. Um, simplest many body problem as usual is already too difficult so we do a mean field approximation what we do is um, we study the one particle distribution function that tells you how the particle moves around where where the effect of all the other particles is accounted for only through the mean fields these will be mean hydrodynamic field and mean chemical field and it, to be precise these two equations so we have the equation for psi the equation for the Stokes flow which are forced at the continuum level by these uh, stresslet terms, which, uh, if you remember, it's exactly the composition of the two terms that we showed before. And uh, uh, they are averaged over all the orientation. Um, and, um, and so basically the forcing of the Stokes equation depends on how the particle are uh, arranged in the suspension. Then there is a chemical field also that is coupled uh, with the, all the equations are coupled and here f through the advection term. And also there is a source. So locally, there is a production of chemical that is proportional again to where the particle are. This is the particle density. It doesn't matter how they are oriented because at leading terms, these are source monopoles. Their orientation doesn't matter. If you go very closely to the particle, of course, their orientation changes the way they interact, but not in the far field. Now that we have the equations, what we do is we do a stability analysis. So we look for a base state in the unconfined domain. There is a uniform state with a uniform, uniform and isotropic. So every, you can find a particle in any point pointing along any direction with equal probability. And you have a uniform concentration field. And because of these two, this determines automatically the fact that there is no mean hydrodynamic field in the base state. So if all the particles are arranged randomly with equal probability because of the superposition that we can do of the flow field on average the flow field they produce will cancel out so the mean hydrodynamic field is zero that's the i think the way to see it and then we look at the and we look at we perturb the base state and we look at how the uh, this kind of uh, solution exponential solution with the uh, growth rate sigma and a uh, wavelength cap okay before I show you the solution to that, we gotta fix a couple of parameters because we don't know what you're talking about really. So let's consider first these kind of particles. These kind of particles are the ones that are neutral swimmers and they have a uniform mobility and all they do is going their own way, diffuse sometimes due to noise, they, they change direction, but um, in general they are attracted by a chemical field because we, they have 
let's say, a negative mobility, and they, are, they experience a drift in it. If we perturb the uniform suspension, that is the base state, the perturbation of a uniform suspension is a non-uniform suspension somewhere. So there are local regions where there's more particles. Those regions will be, there will be more solute produced. More solute generate a gradient, which attracts other particles, and this is clearly an unstable mechanism there. The more you gather, the more the other wants to gather with you. And if the particle swims, it can even escape. This. So actually, self-propulsion not only is not necessary for this to happen, but if, if anything, it has a, a stabilizing effect. And in fact, if we solve the dispersion relation, we say, okay, what's the growth rate here as a function of the inverse of the size of these uh, aggregates? Uh, we see that without self-propulsion, there is all this big uh, range of unstable, uh, or unstable wavelength. Uh, wave numbers, and if as soon as self-propulsion is non-zero, we end up right there, which is what I zoom here. So definitely, the stability analysis confirms this. I would say rather intuitively, fa intuitive fact that self-propulsion stabilizes things, but not only. Self-propulsion before stabilizing things makes the biggest possible, so the longest possible unstable wavelength smaller. And let's see if this happens. This is something I realized when I was writing my thesis uh, by going through the literature, and I realized that there were two examples. So the one that I showed you before, the, the, the phase in between is a stable. And I suggest that that is stable due to self-propulsion. And the cluster that I have formed before have a certain size, and that size doesn't grow anymore. Um, in this case, on the other hand, we have a suspension of particles that are attracted to each other in a similar way, the one that I uh, simplified before. And here, the gas phase in between instead is unstable, and the cluster becomes bigger and bigger, and not only when they form, then they merge. So that could be because there's no, uh, it, what is missing there is this tendency of the particle to swim by their own, or they don't swim fast enough, so the interaction dominates. And that's in line with the stability analysis, I believe. Uh, okay, um, enough about that. Let's talk about a little bit more of a hydrodynamic stuff. So if the particles are of this kind, so the non-uniform mobility, as we said, they orient towards the chemical gradient, so we have a similar instability as before. This time, we need to swim, because the, the, the real attraction to the chemical gradient is due to rotation and swimming. Again, if the particle swims fast, this has a stabilizing effect, but if the particle doesn't swim at all, we don't have the instability. Because this whole rotation thing happens due to the imbalance in, in mobility, <laughs> We might, <coughs> we might expect hydrodynamic effects. These hydrodynamic effects do not appear in the st linear stability analysis, so I won't bother you anymore with that, and we can look at nice videos of simulations of the, of the actual suspension. So we solve the system, um, the, the system of equation before, in two dimensions, uh, in a periodic domain with one angle for the orientation and time. What I show you here is the local particle density, so the, the probability of finding a particle regardless of, of its orientation. Uh, after a transient, initial transient, which depends on the initial condition, we see the formation of these chemotactic aggregates, as, uh, uh, as we can see, which are called asters. Uh, are called asters simply because the particle tends to swim. There is an orientational order to it, like they t swim towards the center. And um, if we wait long enough, we keep integrating the equation in time, we see that <coughs> this cluster breaks into different parts and they start uh, moving around. That's the effect of hydrodynamic interactions. Uh, in fact, if we measure how likely it is that a particle is aligned to the chemi in the chemical gradient, this quantity increases, of course, because that's what the instability is doing. Um, but at some point, when it reaches a certain level, we see that there's a spike in the uh, mean hydrodynamic uh, field. It's just a measure of how strong is this flow field generated by the particle. And at, this, at that point is where, the part, uh, where everything breaks and then starts to move around in that fashion forever. And, um, and that is because, as I said, uh, basically, the particles are aligned to form these asters. And their alignment, this orientational order, allows their own hydrodynamic signature to have a cumulative effect. They sum up. They don't cancel out. Like, if it's isotropic, everything cancels out. If, it's, if there is orientational order, in some generic type speaking, you can have that. So the answer to the question, What's the effect of chemical and hydrodynamic interactions? Well, let's say the hydrodynamic interactions in this case become important because of chemical interactions. The chemical interactions arrange the particles in a way 
that their hydrodynamic field doesn't remain negligible forever. So the stability analysis there wasn't enough to capture that. And what's the role of cell propulsion? I think I already talked enough about it. Um, so let's see what happens a little bit uh, in a nutshell, what happens when we put these things in under confinement and we do things that are, um, we, we do something to the suspension. We, ju we just don't let it go the way it, it's intrinsic behavior. So why we look at that? Because we, we know in the literature there are interesting examples of this. L this is just one of them. Uh, it's, a, it's a suspension of microalgae in a, in a channel flow. And uh, when the light is shed on, depending on which side it's, it's shed on, the particle either go towards the center or they concentrate at the, at, the, at the side. And that is an effect of the particle being rotated by the flow field and being attracted to light at the same time, because they're phototactic. So it's a combination. Or here we have a form of passive control, if you want. So we have those bacterial turbulence that we saw before. If you put them into a channel, the channel, if the channel is narrow enough, they start to go around. So the, it, what was an isotropic kind of motion now becomes directional. And honestly, we don't even have to go so deep into the microscopic work to see that there is uh, something um, uh, about it that is basically, I want to show you this because this is, OK, the, this, the sheep, they also have an intrinsic collective dynamics, OK? That, that is for sure. And they follow each other, and they form, they, they have they, they display correlated motion. And the job of the, uh, the dogs is to control this suspension of sheep, if you want. And the way they bring the, this group of sheep from point A to point B needs to account, their strategy needs to account for the collective dynamics of the sheep. If they were to move one single sheep from point A to point B, they would use a different uh, strategy. So that's to say, if we want to control systems that inter of interacting particles, we, the strategy we use to control cannot just forget about their collective motion. That's it. And I think this is something we've known for a long time. Maybe now we look at it a little differently, but that's still the same. Um, so what's the effect of confinement and flow? We're going to put no flow, then weak flow, then more flow, of course. And does it change the viscosity of the fluid? Again, here we're solving numerically because as soon as you put this boundary condition into the equation, the base states become become more difficult than it doesn't even have an analytical solution. And, um, and what we see is that we observe wall accumulation. So first of all, the base state is uniform in this direction. We have wall accumulation. Here I'm showing the average direction of the particles is, are the arrows. And the, the color is the chemical field through which they interact. Uh, why is that the base state? It can be explained really just thinking on diffusion and self-propulsion. So um, if you have a solid wall and you say particles don't penetrate that wall, uh, particles that are pointing towards the wall will get there and get stuck there for an amount of time proportional to the noise that they, with which they reorient, and the others will leave. So the, the width of the boundary layer is controlled by uh, diffusion against self-propulsion, basically. There's no need to account for anything else than that. Then, of course, quantitatively it changes if we consider all the uh, drift in the chemical gradient and so on. So this is, uh, this is unstable. Though. So if we actually let these particles stay there, and they are, these are the particles that we saw before, the one that tends to form clusters. If we let them there, uh, <coughs> we perturb that state, there is an instability again. And so they will form some form of aggregation. That's what happens. They form these two aggregates here eventually with particle pointing there. And this is a steady state. It doesn't move. Uh, it's very boring. And uh, this, that, that is the transient that leads uh, to it. If we add a little bit of flow, uh, we can look at what happens below. If we had a little bit of flow, everything now it's transported. So we have a form of a traveling wave. And uh, the, there is also a symmetry breaking in the top and bottom uh, part of the, of the channel that we can discuss, but it's not really something, uh, well, we, we can, it's, it's, a, it's a secondary effect, but it, it's there. And actually, if you increase the flow even more, basically the, the vorticity near the wall is so strong that the reorientation of particles through which they communicate, it just, it's subdominant. And so what you see is, Nothing, except that there is, again, this symmetry breaking, which remains because it's not due to that. 
And, um, and then, interestingly, there is also another regime before the flow simply dominates and nothing happens, because that's eventually what's going to happen. And, um, and here you see, slowly but surely, you have some patterns emerging. Uh, I think I was cheap with the frame rate, uh, but they, they're moving in this direction. And, um, and these, again, well, I think the, what I want to point out here is that everything we see, it's due to reorientation of the particles in the chemical fields of the other and the orientation of the particles in the imposed Poiset flow. Here, there's nothing that depends on the flow induced by the particles themselves because we are very confined, and that's just subdominant. That's, that's just the way it is. Um, however, we want to look at it, and, and that's how it works. That's how it looks, sorry. If you remove the Poiset flow and you look at the flow field induced by the particle, that is what you get in all these situations. So no flow field, closed, streamlined, Particles are not pumping fluid left or right. Nothing is happening. As soon as you introduce, a, 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 if you break the symmetry left, right, it also the response of the particle is asymmetric, and they actually do uh, pump some fluid. This is the last one. They almost do nothing. But they're almost all closed. And what we can see is we can say, okay, if we impose a pressure drop on a channel, and there is a flow rate, there is the Poisset flow, and then the particle either increase or decrease that flow rate, we can say, I think, from an engineering point of view, that we have changed the effective viscosity. In the sense that, given the, f given the pressure drop in a channel, what is the flow rate? That's proportional to the viscosity. So if you change the flow rate, you can say we change the effective viscosity. We've got to be careful, because when I say we change the viscosity, a lot of people then uh, don't, don't like it. But if we really stress the fact that it's an effective viscosity, it's what it is. That's why when we, s we look, now I'm going to characterize how the the flow rate induced by the particles changes with time. That's basically all we care about. And, and this is how it, what happens during the, during the process of the instability. So a little disclaimer before. As I said, there are two contributions to the flow field. One is self-induced. One is due to the external gradient. I would say for the sake of, anyway, we can superimpose. We look at one of them, and we don't, uh, we don't bang our head against the wall trying to, to see both of them. Anyway, they're more or less one the opposite of the other because the particle is aligned to the chemical gradient on average. So the flow rate, the particle induced, uh, let's look at the blue one. The self-induced is the one of a pusher in this case. It's the one of a pusher, and I'm looking at the case. Uh, well, you'll see now which case I'm looking at. So at first, we have this uniform situation, the base state, and the particles are enhancing the flow. So the flow rate they induce is positive in the same direction of the other. And that's because they are pusher and that's in line with what one would expect. Pusher are known in certain situations like this one to increase uh, the flow rate given the, the shear. Sorry, induce the flow deformation given the, the, the tangential stress. Uh, and this is what happens. They are increasing the flow. Then as soon as the something happens and there are the collective dynamics going on and they aggregate, we see that the, this signature reverses. And the other, not surprisingly, does the opposite, because as I said, it's the opposite. But what matters is just, just to look at one. I think here the important message is the emergence of collective dynamics can indeed change the way the active stress induced by the particles affect the viscosity. What used to be a suspension of particles that increases, uh, sorry, that reduces the viscosity is now a suspension that increases it, if there wasn't the other effect. But, if you substitute this with a more or less spherical microorganism that is a pusher or a puller, you would only see one effect. So uh, I conclude, I think the conclusions on this part, are, I stress them enough now. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, so we can probably move a little bit and uh, move on to the second part, which is shorter. Uh, don't worry. And uh, it's about the data-driven surrogate model of drop size distribution. So this time, we're still, we're still modeling something that uh, is uh, extremely uh, complicated because the atomization of uh, liquid sprays is a, is a very complicated problem. And, and that's also why it takes a lot to simulate it. And that's also why there's no uh, a general rule to predict what happens given, given the, the, some control parameters. And, but it still is, as we all know, a very important problem that is super relevant to many applications. And uh, however, ex ex obtaining data, even if it is just the data about a ligament breaking up or if it's a spray or it's a high pressure spray, it's expensive, takes time, and we typically have small data. So 
unlike maybe a lot of talks about data-driven fluid mechanics where people stress a lot this big data, da, 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 it's not really big data. We have low data, and we want to make sure we make the most out of them because having reliable data is not, it's not as cheap and they're not as abundant as sometimes we, we hear. Uh, so that's why uh, we developed this method uh, that is, uh, it's called a surrogate model, can be called an emulator, can be called in many ways. The idea is for the, as a toy problem, we produce data ourselves with, uh, by using uh, numerical simulations. We define, again, a toy parameter space that is the, the spray angle alpha, the Reynolds number, and the Weber number. And then we develop this part that is basically how to make the best, the most out of these um, well, numerical data to estimate the drop size distribution in situation where we don't have data. And, uh, and, can, and can we use the model also to guide, for example, what is the best next experiment to do and <clears throat> to inform the, the, the design of, for example, new nozzle if we have an objective. And uh, so that's what we do. Let's see, first of all, a little bit about the simulation. So the simulation are performed uh, in Basilisk. And uh, they, what we obtain at the end of simulation is a population of drops. Then we estimate, we overestimate clearly the sphericity, and uh, we 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 filter out the ligaments that are very elongated. Uh, they might be unstable and corrupt the statistics. We filter out small drops. We filter out super big drops. And in the end, one data point is this. It's a population of drops, which it, then you can decide to put into bins depending on how many drops you have. So that's the kind of data we have. What is a surrogate model of that? So I'm going to give you a very visual explanation, which it's uh, still pretty, I think, uh, close to what we actually do. So this is the design space represented by one dimension, just for the ease of visualization. And we have, let's say, one, two, three, four experiments. These experiments gives us some information about the drop size distribution in the form of there are as many drops in this bin and as many in this other bin. And we compute the probability just by normalizing it. The idea is we want to use an interpolator, which maybe can also extrapolate. In this case, it's a Gaussian process regression for each bin that tells us how that height of the bin basically changes with the design space. The design space can be multidimensional, of course, and gives you also, it gives you an estimate uh, by doing Bayesian inference, basically it gives you the estimate uh, of the um, confidence, basically these are the, the the dot, the dashed line. And when when does this become useful? It becomes useful when you wanted to know actually what was the value of the, the drop size distribution here. So what you have is now you have these surrogate points. So these are not actually measurements, but of course they are what your model predicted and you can use them to estimate the drop size distribution. Now there is a, uh, of course here I'm showing you a lot of data. Like if you actually had all these data, you probably, you probably wouldn't even bother doing it. It's just for the sake of visualization. You can imagine a high dimensional design space in which you have none of these data points which are in other uh, locations. So let's see, for example, two different binning schemes. And this is the result that we obtain. How do we obtain it? So we train another Gaussian process regression, but this time we had to adapt. So there's, uh, this, the thing, because normally Gaussian process regressions are made to interpolate data point. Like you can tell it, go through that point, then to this point, to this point, find the curve that most that fits the best. Uh, but that's not a very useful, way, a very good way to do it. And as I will explain in a second, which is why what we do is we impose the integral. So we say the curve needs to be this integral, and we also give the accuracy. Like we say, okay, I have to needs to have that integral, but there is also some tolerance. And the same with the others, depending on how many bins we use, we'll have many integral observations. And then we also say, because by taking the bins, you are basically removing the information, like you're, you're treating all the drops from here to here in the same way. You lose the information of what is the mean of the distribution. So we can impose also, in the reconstructing this, we can impose the expected value of the, of the drop size distribution, which of course, we, 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 we estimate it based on the mean of the population that we obtained with the simulation. So we have imposed these things and we have reconstructed the PDF. Now, what happens if we do it the naive way? Because to do that, we needed to implement the code uh, instead of using maybe just a, a Gaussian process library in Python, which works extremely well, but tells you how to interpolate this point only. It doesn't tell you how to do this. Um, doesn't let you do this. So the, if you do, uh, if we do the two different, we compare, 
what happens is we obtain these two curves, which are basically not very different. <laughs> in fact, they're almost the same. And one is black, the black one is the one with the integrals, and the gray one is the one with the points. Um, but even if they're very similar, um, the, of course, not surprisingly, the integrals, so the error in the integrals, is it's much larger if we only impose the point up to two order of magnitude, just about, uh, it in the tail, which are the rare events. So that's even, I would say, a pretty critical part of the uh, distribution. And also, uh, sorry, the, um, the, the bias of the estimator, so this is the error compared to the mean of the drop diameters, it's one order of magnitude higher. Now, the idea is, why is this important? Why are you looking at the numbers so closely? Well, the reason is that in many applications for which this kind of surrogate model would be useful, that is for design and explore design spaces in, uh, in applications, these numbers correspond, for example, to the amount of drops, to the amount of uh, volume of fluid that you atomize in drops between this size and this size. And the same here. So. Because in many applications, like in medicine, uh, you need to have a very, uh, a very peak, a very, uh, let's say, the peak of the distribution needs to be precisely where you want it. Because you, you would basically by using, for example, an aerosol, you would expel drops that are too small, or the too big drops they don't get to the target because they get trapped. Or in agriculture, for example, like Syngenta, the partner that we, it's really. Uh, the, with whom we are interacting for this project, told us like we want to be sure when we predict the drop size distribution that um, the volume of fluid in this in drops smaller than a certain size. It's as small as possible because that will be carried away by the wind when we deliver to the plant. And so these numbers actually change. Then uh, sorry matters. And and so then we can also use that. For example, here again, it's really just a toy problem. Like the data we produce are are limited and, and not super accurate because that was not the point, but we can explore, we, we can have fun exploring the design space, so we change the Weber number and this is what happens to drop size distribution, then we can use the, the each of these um, uh, probability functions to produce uh, synthetic populations of drops, like you random number generators, and then you compute the mean volume diameter of the population, you see that it scales uh, linearly when the Weber number is sufficiently high from here on, and as a function of the Weber number, scales linearly as it should. And then we try to extrapolate. So the, the open symbols are the one outside the data range. And it extrapolates up to 40% more than the Weber number, the highest Weber number we've simulated, which is, OK, that's just an information. I, wouldn't, I would say it's not bad, but certainly can be improved. And the, these models are generally not great at extrapolating, like we're not trying to substitute them, they're not going to become substitution of a experiment or a numerical simulation. Of course, actually they need them to work. And here's the, here's the effect of the spray angle, for example. Uh, I think the, the drop size distribution doesn't tell much, but if we produce, again, synthetic population of drops, uh, we take the volume of the drop, and we have a population of volume, and if, when we look at the population of volume, we compute the Gini index, we see this pretty, uh, let's say, consistent, consistent trend of a decreasing Gini index. Now, the Gini index is basically is developed. It was thought for economic kind of issues, so it tells you what is the in income inequality in a given community. But instead of the income, you substitute the volume of the drops. It tells you how unevenly is distributed the volume of the spray in different drops. So, if you have a very high Gini index, it means that you have one or two big drops that have almost all the volume and a bunch of other super small drops. If all the drops have one single <coughs> uh, volume, then you have Gini index equal zero, zero inequality, so like the communism of the spray. And, um, and then uh, the reason why this happens is because larger drops, we, we think, I mean, this is an interpretation I'm happy to discuss, I don't really, uh, I don't, it's not proof, but I think, it, uh, also suggested by the guy that does the experiments in Syngenta, who've seen a lot of sprays, and he told me, I think it's that, and I said, maybe. It's like in this, on the, at the edges, on the rims, you generally create uh, bigger drops. And when the spray angle is very narrow, those bigger drops, as compared to the one that are formed by the breaking of the sheet in the middle, are a lot. And so there's a lot of, most of the volume in those big drops, with higher spray angle, the, the let's say the uh, 
the number of very big drops formed at the edges, it's less important compared to the others. And so you basically have less super rich drops. And, and this is just, uh, I, I really, uh, uh, it's the end. I mean, it's, uh, I talked to you about how can we model these uh, complex problems with uh, basically stochastic processes because these, all these curves are just the outcome of, uh, uh, of um, Gaussian processes. And um, and uh, and how can they? And, and I told you, I didn't show you how that they can be used to optimally design experiments. And uh, and I think, uh, I mean, in my in one thing that I'm thinking of while I'm doing this work is because this Gaussian process can be much more complicated than that. They're being explored right now. It's not widely used, but you can have many Gaussian processes that I have linear relationship between each other. And I think it would be interesting because in my in my past work I did reduced order modeling of the active suspensions. So we have uh, the suspensions that I showed you before were uh, sort of modeled in a simpler way, and then we did the stability analysis and everything. I was thinking that because those reduced model really works well, one could think of modeling uh, using Gaussian processes to uh, basically either optimally design control strategy for active fluids. Uh, like this one. This one is, I, I hope to do better than this because that's what I thought of <laughs> after my PhD and it was really, it was really basic, uh, basic thing to see whether uh, actually the collective aggregation in a certain fashion would change the effect of the thing in the viscosity. If the suspension is modeled by a Gaussian process, we can find maybe an optimal way to do this that has a greater effect and maybe it's even measurable because I don't think this is measurable. So that's also a little bit of what I think to do. And if you want to read more, this is a little bit of what you can find. This is not yet, so I can send it. Uh, I'd be happy, or you can write me an email. And thank you for the attention. And and if you have questions, I'll be I'll be very happy to answer. Do you have question? Okay, I have a question. Uh, do you observe in your um, mi mi micro swimmers uh, collective dynamics sometimes um, real taxes so that the, the, the particles go um, uh, against the flow? Yes, uh, that's uh, maybe I have a slide. I didn't show it, but absolutely because there is basically. Let's see if I have it here. Of course, I don't. Um, maybe I have it in another presentation. Da, da, Let's see. Yeah, the answer is yes because, as you said, like the effect of the flow can be that. So uh, the the base state was of the particle pointing towards the wall when there is confinement. Mm -hmm. uh, when you add uh, when you add the flow, then indeed the particle the flow is going this way. The combination, let's say, of this behavior and the rotation by the flow. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Makes them go up, and in fact, it's not even like mm, that. C for spherical particle, you need a wall because okay. the wall makes, on average, the particle being oriented that way. So if you add the flow, you do this. It, I think for maybe sometimes reotaxis in general doesn't need a wall uh -huh. uh, because the particle is not spherical. So there is a reorientation due to the fact that it prefers a certain direction within mm -hmm. the within the non-uniform flow field, but yes, we, and even with spherical particles, if there's a wall, our model predicts that. Okay, and you can model the, in your model, you can uh, tune the uh, shape of the particles, for yes. example? In yeah, yeah, it okay. would be possible in principle. Okay. We, we, we studied only spherical ones, okay. mm, but yeah, it's mm -hmm. possible. Good, thank you. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, you mentioned, you showed how the fact that the particle swim stabilizes the clustering. Um, and so maybe one question, a simple question is, you, you, you know, one thing, the first effect one think about for stabilization is more like diffusion, just passive diffusion, right? Yeah. So did you compare, do you have an idea of uh, how different it is when they are active, whereas, you know, when they would be passive with just diffusion, in terms of stabilization effect? Uh, okay, so you're talking about particles that still are attracted to each other in mm -hmm. both cases. Okay, uh, 
no, I haven't compared that, but I would say that in general diffusion, defective diffusion then tends to uh, uh, vanish at very long length scales, okay? So this, while the stabilizing effect of self-propulsion doesn't care about that, so there's a different way. So I would say that maybe the effect of diffusion is certainly you can stabilize a suspension with diffusion, uh, that's for sure. Uh, like uh, if you have small enough particles, very high temperature, probably they will. Um, but I would say that it would be still harder to stabilize. Maybe they would form eventually if you wait a very long time. I mean, that's still mathematical, but you would have maybe a positive or at least a zero growth rate at the vanishing at very long scale, very long scale. But yes, they, they both have an effect. And no, I didn't care. I didn't okay. care. Okay. With diffusion, we kept it the way one number because mm -hmm. there are very many parameters and we needed to focus. We said, okay, it's proportion because because we need to pick one. And uh, Okay, thank you. Maybe just one comment. If you go to slide nine, yep. um, the other presentation. so it's just on, in your introduction okay. on the flocking behavior of birds. Yeah. So if you have any bird watchers in the audience, <laughs> uh, they will be a bit shocked by the picture of a starling you have, right? Because <laughs> they would know that it's that not a starling. I right? might have Googled <laughs> it without double checking. So that's that's definitely not a starling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, <laughs> it's probably a welcome swallow, exactly from you Australia. That. So that, maybe uh, just be a bit careful about that. <laughs> they, are, they will be uh, yeah, a bit surprised by be. your choice of picture. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so <coughs> so uh, just another question about them. Um, your your viscosity, your effective viscosity. You have do you have other ideas to to invent a new viscosity to describe your flows? Uh, I mean, the, okay, wait. Yeah, bring up, okay. So, okay, this is, yeah, I mean, there is the viscosity intended as really the, 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 um, the constant or the, the, the proportion, the, per, the factor in between uh, locally at a point, uh, like we are think, we usually think of it as the local, um, um, number that uh, the, the factor that relates the shear and um, the shear rate and the stress. So that it would be probably the only other way that I could think of. And it does it does appear in here because it is basically the local modification to the viscosity is that stress let term strictly speaking, like uh, locally speaking, uh, is the stress let terms in the equations here. It basically would be something proportional to this, the modification to the viscosity. So if you look at that without involving any flow rate, which is, I would say, the right way, or better, yes, yeah, certainly a right way to think about uh, uh, that, yeah, it would be a local definition. Maybe I answer, maybe not. <coughs> Sorry, but the, on there is a, a source term or, or not? I would say where was the, the final model would be a special viscosity depending on shear rate and something like that. And will there be a source term as well or not? Uh, in the viscosity? No, no, in the, in the momentum equation. Ah, yes, yes. Yes, okay. I think that quantifies, like, because this is basically the uh, undisturbed yeah, without sure. particle viscosity. And I would say that that plus something related to this locally is the new viscosity. Yeah. Yes. Plus a source term. It would, I, okay. Yeah. I'm from. I was. Yes. 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 I mean that. Would, I found these of as a source term, like the term depend the mm. changes the viscosity. Yeah. Yeah. Due okay. to the particle. That is what gives rise to the uh, hydrodynamic instability. For example, like they say, even experimentally, they say um, they measured uh, even negative viscosity, and they said, "Okay, oh, we get the negative viscosity." Negative viscosity, in my interpretation, is you perturb something. And then you don't do anything, and that moves by itself. And that is exactly what the hydrodynamic turbulence that we saw before is. is. Like you have a uniform, you have a suspension of particles. You perturb because locally the viscosity becomes negative. What happens is that they basically drive the flow field. It's not a viscosity anymore. It's a, it's a forcing term. Like I think the opposite of viscosity is a local forcing term. Okay. So let's thank uh, again uh, Tulio. Thank you very much.